We begin with this breaking news. The leaders of France, Germany, and Italy have arrived in Kiev in a show of solidarity with Ukraine. The high-profile visit by Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, French President Emmanuel Macron, and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz comes after days of speculation about a joint visit to the Ukrainian capital and as Ukraine pleads for more heavy weapons from Western countries. Ukraine's forces are outmanned and outgunned in fighting for the key city of Severodonetsk. The fierce fighting is taking a heavy toll on civilians not only in Severodonetsk, but also in laboring Lysychansk, too. In the distance, the sound of Russian shelling. For the people in Lysychansk, the twin city of Severodonetsk, the chance to escape is getting smaller and smaller. Ukrainian police officers drive from house to house to find those who want to leave. But for many here, it feels like they're giving up their town. We weren't sure until it became unbearable. Then I got sick. She has an endless list of illnesses. And I'm also sick. If there was a hospital here, I would have stayed here until the very last moment. Only a few kilometers away in Severodonetsk, leaving has become nearly impossible. With all the main bridges destroyed, the city is now cut off. Ukraine says more than 500 civilians are hiding inside the Azot chemical factory alongside Ukrainian soldiers. Moscow announced a humanitarian corridor for the civilians, but then claimed Ukrainian shelling disrupted the plan. With Moscow having more manpower and weapons, it's becoming increasingly difficult for the Ukrainians to hold their few remaining positions in the city. A Russian deadline for the forces in the chemical plant to surrender has passed. Former Ukrainian President Poroshenko told DW, Ukraine will not give in. The situation is extremely difficult and the concentration of troops there is enormous. But our heroic soldiers is keeping Severodonetsk, we keeping the uh, Azov, uh, not Azov, but Azov chemical plan, and uh, we never surrender. Away from the Donbas, Russian forces have been aiming for other high-value targets. This footage, shared by the Russian military, claims to show high-precision, low-range missiles targeting a depot in the western Lviv region, where ammunition for NATO-supplied weapons is stored. If true, it could be Russia's latest effort to disrupt the international supply of weapons. Let's get an update now from our correspondent, Roman Goncharenko. He joins us from Ukraine's capital, Kiev. Roman, the leaders of the EU's three biggest countries, Germany, France and Italy, are in Kiev today. What's the significance of this visit? Well, it's hard to overestimate the significance of this visit because uh, the three leaders of the major European countries are visiting Ukraine, which is fighting a very difficult and um, very bloody war. And uh, they were criticized before this visit for not doing this earlier, criticized for not delivering enough weapons to Ukraine to defend itself. They were criticized for talking too much to Vladimir Putin, Russian's president, or being too soft on him. So there was a lot of pressure on all three leaders, especially on the leaders of Germany and France, before this visit. If they will manage to, um, um, to silence critics and to show the solidarity with Ukraine, to say that really standing with Ukraine, this question will be solved today in a few hours. They are meeting with President Zelensky here. And what is also very important, this visit is taking place at a historic moment for Ukraine. Ukraine has applied uh, to become a candidate for EU candidacy and in, in the coming days the EU summit will decide that. There is also a summit of G7 in Germany and NATO summit, com NATO summit coming. The war in Ukraine will be on top of the agenda and the Ukrainian president also agreed to take part in the G7 and NATO summit, but it's not quite clear at the moment whether he'll travel himself or will just be connected via a video link. Okay, so a strong diplomatic show of support from Europe. Meanwhile, the U.S. has announced another billion dollars in military aid for Ukraine. How important is that military aid for the country? 
It is extremely important, and this is what we are hearing from Ukrainian authorities every day, every hour, and every minute here in Kiev. They are saying that the Russians, uh, the Russian artillery, for example, in the east of Ukraine, where, where there is heaviest fighting in this war, uh, outnumbers the Ukrainian by 10 times. And they are also criticizing that the West has so far delivered only 10 percent of the weapons promised. So Ukraine is expecting more weapons to come in the coming weeks to be able to stop the Russian advance in the east of Ukraine, where the fighting continues. There are multiple flashpoints in this war. What can you tell us about the latest fighting, Roman? Well, the, the situation remains pretty, mu pretty much the same as in the past few days. Uh, the heaviest fighting is in the city of Severodonetsk, which is an administrative, used to be actually, an administrative center of the region uh, Luhansk. And uh, Ukrainian forces are still holding the positions there. And uh, the, uh, the skeptics who are expecting them to, to, to abandon the city a few weeks ago, they are still there, they are still fighting. But uh, the, it, it is getting more and more difficult for the Ukrainian army to resupply them with weapons. And one more problem remains, it's the problem of civilians who still stay in that city. And an attempt was made to evacuate civilians uh, who were hiding at a chemical plant in Severodonetsk. But we, they are still there and that attempt was not successful so far. I think in the coming hours and days there will be more attempts. Roman, thank you very much for bringing us up to date there. That was our correspondent, Roman Goncharenka, in Kiev. Well, let's get more now on the German perspective on that diplomatic initiative by three European leaders. Uh, our correspondent, Theresa Tropper, is with us now. Uh, she's in our parliamentary studios here in Berlin. Theresa, why is German Chancellor Olaf Scholz visiting Ukraine now? What's the purpose of his trip? Well, that's the big question now, Terry. Um, Olaf Scholz has previously said that he wouldn't go to Kiev just to take a photo. And so that has somewhat raised expectations that if he does go there, he will have something to offer. And that, of course, could be more financial support. It could be more arms deliveries. After all, Ukraine's President Zelensky has criticized both Germany and France, and to a lesser extent also Italy, of being too slow when it comes to arms deliveries and of putting their own prosperity ahead of Ukraine's freedom and security. But these three could also bring good news um, with regard to Ukraine's bid to become a member of the European Union, because as we heard, the meeting and the visit in Kiev comes just ahead of a key meeting in Brussels, where the European Commission is expected to propose that Ukraine uh, becomes a member of the bloc. Why did it take Chancellor Scholz so long to visit Ukraine? This, this visit has been anticipated for months. Oh, yes. Uh, Olaf Scholz was certainly invited a lot of times since the war broke out. Uh, but back in April, there was some rift between Berlin and Kiev because Kiev rebuffed on very short notice a visit by the German president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, saying that he was too close to Russia, that he made mistakes in dealing with Moscow in the past. And after that, Olaf Scholz himself ref refused to go there for a couple of weeks. But that dispute was solved in a telephone call. And uh, since then, several German politicians have visited, most notably Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, but also other ministers, the president of the German Bundestag, and even the head of the biggest opposition party. And the fact that Olaf Scholz himself did not go for such a long time also caused some criticism here in Germany. So what's being said about this diplomatic gesture here in Germany, Teresa? Well, uh, Germans are certainly watching this visit very closely because many feel that Ukraine should get all the support it needs. But at the same time, they're also worried about what the war in Ukraine means for their own lives. So I went out uh, to the streets of Berlin to ask people how they feel about this visit now. Let's take a listen. I think it's good. He should do a lot more. He doesn't do enough. You have to help them. It's not convincing to keep saying that Ukraine has to win. But at the same time, the arms deliveries being announced are falling short of expectations, at least for the time being. That's a contradiction that has to be resolved somehow. The fact that he goes there to exchange views is basically good. He should help the people by supplying decent weapons instead of dithering.
I think if these three travel there together, they'll have something to say. I hope so, that they don't just go there out of decency. So quite a lot of suspense here in Germany as well when it comes to what uh, Scholz, Macron and Draghi are exactly up to in Kiev. Theresa, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Theresa Tropper there. Well, Mark Montgomery is a military expert with the Foundation for Defence of Democracies who served in the US Navy for more than 30 years and helped to build US-Ukrainian military relations. Welcome to you, Mark. I wonder what will this latest pledge of weapons allow Ukrainian forces to do on the battlefield that they aren't currently able to do? Well, first, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, that is the big question. And I would say it's really more about maintaining their ability to do what they, what they can do right now, which is you have to have these replenishment packages flowing every few weeks if Ukrainians, if Ukrainians to succeed in, in preventing further Russia, Russian encroachment in the Donbas region. Um, they're burning through artillery very rapidly, and they need these replenishment packages, not just from the U.S., but from the rest of our European allies and partners in the contact group. Uh, is it, there a chance that this war will be decided by the outcome of battles, Mark, or is it going to come down, as you may suggest there, down to who runs out of money first? Well, you're, you're exactly right. This is a grinding campaign. So I don't think this is about some, you know, mo you know some military flair or manoeuvre that settles things rapidly, but it's about who can maintain their resilience, uh, Russia or uh, Ukraine and its European and American allies. And so, you know, this kind of slugfest uh, requires this constant replenishment. And like I said, every two or three weeks uh, with, these, uh, with these artillery rounds, what we're transferring here is only 36,000 rounds. They're expending 5,000 rounds a day. So this is seven days of artillery rounds being transferred in this package. It's an incredible stat, just, just a week's worth of supplies, if you like it. Um, is there a risk with that in mind that this help, as significant as it sounds, has just come too late? Now, I think it's, it's a question of persistence. Will the US and its uh, European allies show the same resilience the Ukrainian people and their army are showing on the battlefront? Will we continue to provide these packages every few weeks, you know, every two weeks from the United States, every two weeks from Europe uh, to bring artillery rounds, the uh, rocket rounds that are also included in this package, but also vehicles, artillery vehicles. There's 18 in this package, but we need other ones from our European partners and then rocket launching systems from our European partners as well. US Army Chief of Staff Mark Milley spoke today, Mark, uh, saying he thought Russia had lost somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of their armoured force. Do you believe that to be true and does that offer hope, if so, for Ukraine in a war of attrition? Well, first, I do believe it's true. And, and I believe you could even caveat that with it's some of their, their better equipment that was more likely than not able to operate. In other words, some of their 100 percent of equipment is equipment that just doesn't get out of the hangar or the, uh, you know, or the garage. And so I really think they've lost a significant warfighting capacity in this uh, in, in this uh, three, you know, 100 plus days uh, combat so far. And if they try to grind it out over the summer in eastern Ukraine, they're going to lose another 20 to 30 percent. Military expert Mark Montgomery, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.